Hi everyone, I'm Marie and we are coming to you live from Living Felt because it's Happy Wooly Wednesday! Oh, happy Wednesday friends and for some of you it's Thursday like for Marianne all the way in Australia. Thank you guys so much for joining us. If you landed on this feed welcome to the live show we are living felt based in central texas and as you can see we have friends all over the world we're so happy you're here today we are picking up on last week's lesson of making a wild and woolly flower and we're going to show you how to make these fabulous ombre layouts so that you can get fantastic things like more wild and woolly flowers so lots of fun to have today lots of tips and as you can see some folks are already posting questions in the live chat chat about wet felting. So we're going to welcome your general wet felting questions today, as well as go over these tips for getting an ombre or variegated layout. So now listen, this is an interactive show. We want you to ask questions. It's already happening right now in the chat. And if you're watching the replay, ask down below because you get chances to win whether you're live or watching the replay. So I'm going to say hi to some folks who have already checked in. Audrey's in the UK. Dory is in Maryland. Linda is in Florida. Tammy's in South South Carolina, Susie in Missouri. Thank you all so much for being here. I see um, Laura in Maryland, Anne in North Carolina. Hi, Anne. Julie in California. Teresa said she missed last week because it was her mom's birthday. It's okay. You get a free one. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I wanted to tell you we're going to give away prizes from the replay last time. So people who watched and commented when we made our wild and woolly sunflower last week, lots of fun. Lots of you got kits too. So we're looking forward to seeing those and our winners from the replay are Susan Martin and Catherine Karsten and you win either the flower kit or our little needle felting a bee fairy whichever you would like so the fairies are all lined up here with some goodies to share with you that you might like for felting your own fabric whether you're making flowers or something else and first up is the very magical fairy Anne Yay! Yay! Hi friends, so I have so many fun goodies to share with you today. So these are all going to be studio packs that are available in the 19.5 micron merino top. You can find all of what we're going to show today on our website livingfelt.com under the wool section. So the first up is this beautiful and bright dreaming of summer pack. Mm. Ah. <laughs> So we're gonna start from the top here. This is coral, daffodil, zinnia, red, citrus, and sun. This is the dreaming of summer pack, but wait, we're not done. We have got this beautiful fella right here. This is the feeling earthy studio pack. It's a lot of browns, a lot of, a lot of good fall colors. Alrighty. This is milk chocolate, burnt orange, sand dollar, saffron, coffee bean, and mushroom. This is the feel, again, feeling earthy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and last but never least, we have the our newest studio pack. This is the Caribbean Breeze. Very summery, tropical vibes. We're really excited about this one. This right here is chartreuse, cornflower, bali, sea glass, zinnia, and coral. Again, this is our newest studio pack. It's called Caribbean Breeze. And we have a couple of others, just one or two to show you. <laughs> Next up is Fairy Alyssa. Yay! Yay, Alyssa here, and I'm so excited to share with you another one of our Merino Top 19.5 Micron Studio Packs. This one is called Chasing Butterflies. So here we have Bordeaux, Raspberry, Petunia, Lavender, Iris, and Purple. And this pack definitely makes me think of flowers in bloom in my garden and all the fun, cute butterflies that are attracted to those flowers. And we can't wait to see what you guys make with this pack. I also have one more to show ya. This one is called Going With The Flow. All right, here we have Bay, Glacier, Midnight, Horizon, Evening, and True Blue. 
And this one is also very great for oceanscapes, or even if you're feeling a little blue that day, this will be perfect for you. All right, up next is Fairy Angela. I also got some more 19.5 micron merino top studio packs to show you. Um, this one is called Catching Moonbeams, and it's great for any nighttime accessories you might want to make. All right, so the colors we have in this would be ebony, charcoal, slate, smoke, mist, and lily white. Wow. Very nice. Yeah. We have some people asking in chat what the weight is of this bundle. I think each one is one ounce. Mm -hmm. Each, yeah, each, each color is one ounce, so you've got six ounces total. Nice, <laughs> thank you. And then I've got one more to show you. Some beautiful earthy greens. And this one is called uh, Living Green. So this one would be good for landscapes or, you know, if you want some earthy greens in the background. Um, let me go ahead and tell you the colors for this. Start in the middle, this is chartreuse. And then we've got moss, prairie, evergreen. Oh, I'm sorry, that one's fur. <laughs> this is sprout and that is evergreen. And we can't wait to see what y'all make with these. And up next is Marie. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just see a big round of hearts for all of the fairies? This is our crew. They pack your orders, they answer your emails, they answer your phone calls, make fantastic stuff, and help us name all of our really fun packs. And um, yeah, just appreciate them and you all so much. So thanks for joining us today. I want to give you just a little closer look at the fabrics that we are. I'm going to show you how to do the layout on. If you missed last week, we made this sunflower from a solid fabric using our new Wet Felting a Flower kit. We topped it with both Tussa Silk and with Viscose. And the flower kits have lovely assorted colors. We did show those on the last show. And they are, uh, there's a link in the description to the flower kit. There's also a link to last week's show where you can see where we made these. But let's look at these fabrics just a little more closely so you are, have an idea of what we're going to be doing. This is the solid fabric we made and you can see it's solid all the way through. We cut out our flower petals and then we built these really, we wet felted the leaves petals more and then we built these fantastic flowers. Here we have made, using the same flower kits, we have taken our fibers and created a really nice ombre layout here in the orange. And this is just a variegated layout in the purples. What's different about these two is this one goes from light to dark, and this one goes light, dark-ish tones here, or hues to light. And I wanna show you these um, from both sides and let you ask questions, but I'm gonna show you exactly how we laid these out. So these are the fibers that are in the kits, and let me just show that to you so you can kind of put it together in your mind. Maybe we can come out a little bit and see so you can see everything. There we go. Okay, so looking at these two, these flowers are built, this is from the Sunny Days kit. We built this variegation, and this is also from the Sunny Days kit, so you can go solid or variegated. And then this is from the, we call it um, Gerber or Gerber or Daisies. Uh, you get all of these colors, plus some bling, which I have on the top here, and I'll show you that. Cool? Okay, so we're gonna look at this layout today. How do you achieve an ombre and we're not hand carding? We want to look at how we do that. So I started with the same um, template that we made our last flower from last week, and that is a 14 and a half by 14 and a half uh, square. And I drew four, I divided it into four equal parts, and that's pretty easy. I just folded it in half and drew a line up the middle and then folded that in half and drew a line up the middle. And I did this so that I would know how far down I wanted to lay each color. So why don't we start with the yellow, um, the orangish or sunny days ombre and look at how we lay this out. The first thing I wanna show you is the back. I wanted this to be solid color all the way through. Um, if you've watched our wet felting, a uh, paper thin fabric, uh, 
that we did a few months back or a few weeks back anyway, we used a thin layer of pre-felt on the back. You can make your base layer a solid color if you like, especially a complementary color, but I wanted this to not have any other colors coming up through the top. I really wanted to control what the front of this looked like. So I started with a horizontal layer of my colors and I'm going to show you that. And as I said, we're gonna welcome your questions today and we're only gonna do a, a part of this. So remember, divide your fibers into nice thin strips so that you have 100% control of it. And we're just gonna lay this out a little bit today so that you can see. Let me go to the side here. Um, so we're not too off the side. Notice that um, I'm doing a very thin layout here. If we, if we get, look, I'm doing a very thin layout. The fibers are very, very thin. We're, we did a half ounce approximately, a little more than a half ounce of fiber laid out um, <laughs> on each layer of this. So right here where you're just coming to the line, you can always just pull a thin little bit and you can go just over the line if you want. So we're just gonna do a thin strip of this. So a very thin layer, horizontal first, of all your colors going in a graduated or light to dark. No, let's do this, I'll leave that open. We can move over, okay. Now, I'm interested to hear, while I'm laying this out, how many people um, did the flower kit. I know a lot of you got it. Have any of you made the flowers yet? We would love to know about it. What have you done? Um, see here that I'm just lightly overlaying the previous layer, the previous row, just going lightly over that. And I'm flipping this because I want the blunt end to the outside. That's gonna help me control a more even layout because this end is always fanned or a little more rounded and this end that I've ripped off is a little more blunt. So I just flip those around. And then we overlap this layer, just this one just about a third going horizontal. In this layout, if any layer, bottom or top is more dense, I'm gonna let the bottom be a little more dense than the top. Okay, we're gonna go to this orange. This is citrus. So this was sun. This is sunshine, this is citrus. Again, peeling my layers very thin. And right now we're only building the underneath layer so that we have homogeneous color all the way through. What's it people saying, Jordan? A few people got their kits and they're really excited to start. Some people are very inspired by the ombre colors so far. Not a lot of questions. Cool, y'all. Thanks for being here with us. Um, okay, so here we are. Now we have three, and you can see that we have our colors. Um, we have a gradation of color, but it's not very smooth. So meaning you can see line, line, line. And when we lay out the top layer, you're going to see what's different about that, What, how I change things up a little bit without carding fibers. So as long as we're in the shot, okay, good. Here we go, backwards. If your fiber's sticking to you or sticking up, like mine is a little bit, you can add some lotion to your hands. Sometimes it's just static electricity and you can also mist or use like a little evaporator in your room just to kind of tame it down. Here we go, so now we have this nice, um, this nice blend here. Now, when you're doing an ombre or when you're thinking of one color under the next, very often you want a dark color underneath a lighter color. So let's, let me just show you that for a second. If I were to put this color on top of this color, let's, let's go a little darker. Let's go this color on top of this color up here in the yellow. It's going to be more obvious if this color is sitting on top of that color. So now as we build up our bottom layers, I'm gonna go from dark to light. And we're gonna change things up a little bit, starting with the bottom right down here. So I'm gonna start with the bottom and flip my layers upside down, just like we did on the other, uh, just like we did you know, going horizontally, going vertically. And this pattern is going to convey. Now normally, 
you see me flip my ends and normally I would lay my fibers down just like this, right on top. But to create a really nice ombre, one thing you might try is keep going in this same direction. So let your fanned out end be the one that goes just underneath the next layer. Again, we're just overlapping like about a third, a quarter to a third with our fibers as we shingle. This is called shingling when you overlay. And now we're going up into here. So when I get to this orange color, I am going to flip this. So I'm gonna take my fanned end right here and I'm gonna let it go into this fanned area right here. This is what's different. Normally, you keep the same pattern uh, here. We were laying out this way, but I don't want a hard line. So I'm gonna take that fanned end and let it lay right on top of this darker fiber. And now, this is just my way. I've honestly never, I, this is just kind of what I do. I don't know if other people do this. I've never really seen how somebody else does an ombre. But so here, when we get up to this, you can have the fanned out end be headed that direction um, and just about a third. So it's going to be thinner. It's going to be a little thinner there. I'm having, there we go. Shauna's impressed. She says you can barely even see the change of the color. Once <laughs> yeah, once it lays down. Now, the difference between uh, this ombre that you're looking at and the one that I wet felted is I put a lot of bling on top that was, um, it didn't exactly match the color underneath and it, you know, it kind of hid that really nice ombre. So I wanted to make sure and show that to you here. And that flipping of the layers really helps blend it. So you can see how hard this line is right here. And we're about to take that last one away. Just laying that right on top. This way, you can make an ombre without even hand carding to blend the joins right there. You can blend the joins if you want. You can blend this color and that color to create a little split right here um, if you want. But if you flip them like this, you're going to have a really nice layout. And this will wet felt together beautifully. So with this piece right here, this is what you're looking at. This is how much it shrunk, and we'll look at that together too. But what happened here is I created, I put sun, this same yellow, um, viscose on top. I had a mixture of sun and this color, sunshine, viscose all the way down to here, and then I added some viscose here in um, marigold. So that isn't in the kit. The marigold viscose is not in the kit, but that's why these look a little more uniform in here is because I put lighter colors on top of this. But I, that's what I wanted. I, want a, I wanted a bunch of sheen. And so to draw the picture for you, when I cut out my flower petals, all of my smaller petals came from this division right here. All of my medium petals, almost all of my medium petals, if you look at them, maybe we can get a real close at these and you can see how variegated they are. Let me pull this a little to the side so you can see how this is kind of the gold to the orange and this is a little more gold, but I wanted all of this variegation within these petals so that they would be very, interesting and striking and not as flat maybe as these yellow ones and then the base layers down here we have orange and then orange or it's really called um marigold marigold and the gold so this this transition here let me bring this over this transition here with the bling on top is where we get all of these really nice dark petals and they're really interesting and fun and shiny and that all those come together to make a really dynamic flower with a lot of punch <clears throat> yes okay so that there's this is the sunny days 
wet felt felting a flower kit option. So it's our wet felting a flower kit. That's the sunny days blend. And that's how we did that ombre layout. So let me show you what's a little bit different in doing the um, Gerber or Gerber Daisy layout. What's different about this one? And we have any questions on that before I move on? Uh, just a few or general thoughts? questions. Um, Jessica asks um, if we hand blended the two colors instead, how would we lay them down? Um, on the joins, mm -hmm. how would you lay them down? Well, then what you could just do is bridge is bridge the gap. So sorry, I should have gotten that before. I, let's see if I can look at that before we go. So let's look at the joins here. And if we want to hand blend the two, so why don't we hand blend this transition, which is definitively gold through orange. What you see here is, what we have here is that the staple length of the fiber is pretty long. You know that compared compared to the branch, you know, this, this row. Uh, the staple length of the fiber is what happens, like what's the length of the fiber as it comes off the sheep? You could tear it, you know, if you want it to be shorter for this, this bridge, but that's not necessarily easy. However, I'm going to show you a blend of these two. Let me get this out of the way. And when I hand blend, I think that's what she asked for, right? <coughs> hand card or hand blend? Hand blend. Okay, so if we hand blend these two, let's just pull off a small amount because the blend isn't going to be all that big. And I like to always start with a 50-50. And in this case where you're doing this transition, a 50-50 makes the most sense. And you can start with them one on top of the other, but usually what I'll do is take at least a piece and put it on top. You're just going to grab one side with your hand so that you're able to hold it all by itself and this side a little more loosely but enough so that you can pull them apart and stack pull them apart and stack now it's up to you to turn it over it's up to you how homogenous that blend is maybe you want some streaky stuff I do that with my top layers my viscose and tassa or whatever I like to get the streaks up there but you can see we can kind of blend this and you can keep blending it as much as you want and make it as homogenous as you want now if you were running a bigger color span you might want to do this maybe you're making a really long scar for a table runner or a coat or anything where the run is longer so that you have room to put this in so now because this is so short if I were to lay these fibers in the middle, um, it's going to take up more than half of each of those spans. Can we see all of that? It's going to take up more than half of all of those spans. But just to demonstrate, I'll do it on this half over here. Right here, you can see where it would go. And mine's a little streaky. You would have to keep, let me go here. You have to keep carding, keep blending to make it not streaky. I'll pull the most homogenous pieces out. And this would make it very, very gradual. So you need a little more of the yellow um, in the span, but that's how you would do it. If you just want to hand blend, you just pull and stack and pull and stack and keep redistributing the fibers until you have the blend the way you want it. And if it's too much of one way, you know, like it's too orange, add more yellow. Too yellow, add more orange. Just keep working at it. Um, until you're happy with it. But I think in this case, this run is too short for the length of the staples to add this blend in the middle. It would work if you had a longer, a longer color run. It would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Or you can tear these fibers. So if you really want to cover them, then you could tear them to a shorter length. It's kind of hard to do when it's, I'm dealing with such a small amount. But that's what you could do is tear them. Okay? Any other questions on that? Um, we have one more of a color theory question. Are there any colors that would kind of muddle up the center that you shouldn't put together, or do all colors kind of work? Well, I think you should make a sample. I mean, my idea is always to make a sample. I'm not a real studious person when it comes to color theory and understanding. My, our friend Kimberly Pulley was here a few weeks back, and she's a trained artist and going over color theory and compliments and opposites, and I'm the worst at that, at that topic. So I, I just pick colors I like, like I just bring a whole bunch of colors together and then I'll just play with them until I like them. So in this case, um, we're gonna be working with, like if we do the purples, these colors may not make a lot of sense. I like how they came together on the flower and I think it's also a really fun way, a fun way to test the colors. So the colors we used for this piece are, I took it from the pinkish pink to a berry to a, like a more of a straight up purple and then this 
lilac-y color down here. This may not seem like it makes a lot of sense, but for me, on the flower, I like it. Like once you hide all those lines uh, and you have this variegation, I really like it. And so let's look at what's different about this. And you ask about the muddying. So for me, I've muddied up the joins with my viscose. For this flower, I used these two colors of viscose and I didn't keep them in their departments. I could have used, you know, only the berry up here and only the purple here and even gone with a lighter color down here, but I wanted the punch of that dark on top. So if you don't want to muddy it up, then keep this color, you know, keep the accent color or the shiny color the same or as consistent as you can all the way through. But me, I wanted that dark on top. So let's look at at this one. So in this case, I didn't try and go from light to dark. I went light, similar dark, dark, light. And we're just going to do the same thing. So again, the fourths, uh, my, it's divided in fourths. Uh, it's about a half ounce per layer, approximately, of fiber. So a horizontal layer, about a quarter ounce. A vertical layer, about a quarter ounce. You can go a little bit over, and there's enough in the kit to go a little bit over. But you can also make a solid flower like we did last week. Okay, I appreciate your questions. Thank you very much, and keep them coming, because we want to help you. Um, general uh, wet felting layout questions are, are also fine. actually did mine the opposite way. Uh, I went, <laughs> I did mine from pink to purple, but we'll go this way. Okay, and this is the bottom layer. So again, I'm not really, I'm not really concerned about who's on top and who's on bottom, but just notice that when you do an ombre, um, what color is coming through on the bottom what color's coming through to the top. That's why we're doing it this way, so that we have more of a homogeneous uh, layout of color. And you can see already, this one's getting a little wide, so I'm gonna let the, the pink come into here, but I'm not going to. I love this purple. <laughs> this purple, I wished I had used a little more in my purple flower. If you use this purple, I don't think you'll be sorry if you like purple. I don't think you will. Okay, this is the berry or raspberry it might be called. And look, it doesn't matter if you decide to go fill in this hole and then this hole. It doesn't matter. You can do it whatever way you want. You can keep turning your angles this way too. That's fine too. I'm gonna go right here. Okay, now for our lightest color. It's light but bright. It's not really pastel. Okay. Gentle overlaps. This is a great project for just practicing wet felting. You can make the fabric and then figure out what do you want to make with it later. You don't have to make the flowers, but they really are fun and they're super easy and, and people really like how they look. Okay, so now here we have lights and lights and darks and darks, and we said, well, we kind of like we kind of like the darks under the lights, and that's totally up to you. You can break that up, you know, next time if you want. Um, meaning you can you can go a different route um, rather than starting with the darks right now you can have the dark on top of the light but I'm going to uh, let's see I'm going to do one layer of my pink here again we're going to we're going to flip that edge and I'll let you see what it looks like if the if Flipping it this way, if those are in the middle and we can't, let's say for your layout, it just doesn't make sense to put the dark under the light. Let's see how it looks when we keep with the same layout pattern of blending or letting our fanned layers come together right there. I'm patting all the time because I want the air out. You want your fibers to lay down and you want the air out. So here we go. Now I'm just going to blend these two and I'm letting the dark go on top. 
And look still how smooth that looks. I don't know if you can see like up close how gradual it is when both of your fanned edges come together. I'm going to let this go up into the purple, but again, I'm going to flip so that what would be a blunt edge will be hidden in that homogenous color of being all berry or raspberry and let my fanned edge go up there into the purple. I'm flicking it backwards. It's just rather than turning my hand around. And here we go. So this is just a method for doing your ombre layout. You still want to pat your hand along, make sure your fibers are laying down, make sure that you don't have any bare spots or thin spots so you can patch it in where you want to. And since this is so big, I'm going to go ahead and just come in with my light dusty purple here. It's my lilac. Very gentle. JJ is asking if you always need to lay each layer in the same direction. When, when JJ, that's a great question. So whenever we're, we're making a fabric out of raw fiber or carded fiber or whatever, um, when you're using something like a sliver, this is called a sliver or a top, um, or even roving where it's produced in sort of a long length, the fibers are going to be kind of longer. You do want to make that whole layer, at least base layers, in the same direction. Now you'll see there are times when we get into the design layer and the design layer can be willy-nilly. Design layer might be your third or fourth layer, depending on how thick your piece is, it might be your sixth layer. So the reason we want to, we do want to lay out each layer in the same direction when we're building the foundation of the fabric is because fiber is going to shrink not only in the way it's rubbed and rolled or agitated, but in the way the fibers are laid out. So in this case, we're doing a traditional crisscross layout, which is one layer horizontal and one layer vertical. So whatever, it's just like an X, right? There are other layouts where you can do like more of a chevron. Um, you can do more of a chevron pattern, and a chevron pattern can serve as two layers. It provides a little more stretch. Um, or it can serve as one layer. So it, like if you're doing a nano felt, you can lay down a fabric and then you just have one layer of fiber. If it's in a chevron format, that's a little bit different than the traditional crisscross. Um, and you can also lay one layer, like if you want something to shrink across, you can lay all the fibers going in that direction. So, but in each layer, if you will, if you're trying to make a square piece of fabric, so let's say not something that you want to shrink different ways in different parts, but you're just making a square fabric, you will be more benefited if you can control the uniformity of layout in each layer. So yes, each layer going in the same direction until you get to your design layer, which is usually often a bit thinner. Yeah, good question though. What, what else? What else would y'all like to know? And do we like this? Do you like this layout? This is the this is the flower that I made with that. So I had a lot of fun with this one. And with each of these, I I look at parts of it and think, oh, I, you know, there are there are things that I would do differently. But cutting out each individual petal really took me on a journey and allowed me to really look at what I have here. So here I'm going to turn this around. So, so the pink petals obviously are in the very middle, and then we have our sorry, my head. <laughs> the pink petals are in the very middle. We have our berries and where the berries and purples came together was my absolute favorite part. Um, and then I liked these darker back here, but I especially liked where this purple and this dark color came together. So I was happy with either the purple underneath or the lilac underneath, or la I'm not sure, lavender I guess, underneath. Um, but I really liked this juncture right here. And I think even you know, making a fabric like this and then turning it into something is a great way to make a sample of fibers and colors together and deciding what you like. So this has obviously become small scale because each petal is its own thing. Um, but this fabric, you might decide, well, I, I want to use that for a hat or a purse or a table runner or the background for something that you needle felt maybe. Um, but I really like doing these little fabrics. And I want to show you this um, layout here uh, and how meaningful it was because we always talk about shrinkage 
I'm gonna park all my fibers over here. And I didn't, I was sharing with the gals that I didn't even really realize this uh, sort of aha moment until I was looking back at the photos of the stuff I made. And I told you that I divided this into four equal parts. Well, I took some pictures of the fulling because after wet felting, the piece was still very close to this size. And then fulling, I shrunk it down and I suggested you might want to shrink something down 25, 30%. And you can tell that it's approximately 25% because this is a quarter. <laughs> this is the one quarter line right there. So if you turn it, if you don't even have to really do math, if you divide up whatever pattern you used for your layout, you can see that this has shrunk approximately 25% each way. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You can have a little mark up your template or pattern, whatever you're using, to see how much has something shrunk or mark your targets. Like if you want it to shrink 30% or 40%, we'll just mark it on your paper at that third or place. Yeah, see what you want. Nice. Cool. What else can we tell you? We have a couple questions about uh, embellishment fibers. Okay. First, Kevin asks, how forgiving is it if you don't like one of the colors and you want to add another color on top or replace oh, it? I would say, you know, in the dry layout phase, you know, if don't lay out something big and try and try and do that because then you're going to have to tear it all apart and you'll lose, you'll lose that beautiful uniformity. Like, the layout is key for an even fabric. The layout really matters. So I would say if you're really not sure, start this big or make something small. See how you like those two colors coming together. I think this is small. This is a small sample. So you might be able to peel this apart. Like this is, um, I wouldn't handle this too much, but if you look at this piece that I have here, and I've just lifted this off the table and you know put it over to the side again, but if you don't like this color, this is a little bit easier because you can you know go and fix those layers. But if you're not sure, the best way would be is if it's sandwiched between something rigid, that's not really easy to do because you're going to have to peel this off and it's in blended layers. So you would have to be very diligent to peel those apart and then get your nice even sandwich back. See, because these ends are sandwiched in between layers. So my recommendation would be if you're really not sure, instead of making this piece, which is, um, let's see, three of these. It's more than two. It's like three of these widths almost. Then just make a strip and see how you like it. Let this be your sample so you see how you like those coming together rather than this be your sample because then you'll waste less fiber and less time. Yeah, good question though. It's, if you go too far, the answer is it's going to be kind of a mess to take it apart. <laughs> but have we all done it? Yeah. And have we all made a little gap here or there? Yeah. And if you get a bare spot, we'll just patch it in. <laughs> these are flower petals they're a little forgiving you know they don't all have to be perfect uh, everyone doesn't have to be perfect flowers aren't perfect but they're pretty amazing mathematically speaking you know how the centers are anyway okay what other questions do you have uh, Christina asks did you put bl bling fiber sorry excuse me bling fibers on the same way as the merino or like in little clumps or how do you uh, about bling if you watch the last video you can see how we did it um, if you watch the last video, and I did bring them out here, but um, I, in some cases I hand carded them together, but all the bling fibers, here, here's kind of what we did. So whether they were carded together one color or multiple colors, what we did is kind of, you know, I had them in my hand and then I would kind of, sometimes they would be stringy like this piece and I would just let them go down, but I would kind of tear them up a little bit and then drop them down because I wanted them to be streaky but I also wanted them to be kind of webby if you will so this is kind of how I put them down I didn't put them down all in one direction because I like how they get all mixed up and disorganized um, but you can even lay them out just all horizontal but this is more what I did whether it was one color or a blended color I kind of threw it down like that Mm -hmm. And let, I let them do what they want. I'm not too fussy about it. I just want the shine. Yeah, but I didn't want them going this way on petals that are going to be going up and down. You know, they could be mixed up, but I didn't want them going horizontal. <laughs> Yo-Yo yeah. asks if you have any tips for placing viscose and silks because it just flies all over when they're going at it. The, oh, well, then you have a lot of static electricity in your space. And so I would say if you have a humidifier, go ahead and run it 
that's again with the lotion put lotion on your hands anything to make your hands less sticky and then you can kind of get a just a regular water bottle mister and spray it over your workstation you can kind of spray it above and let it land down um, and you can also if you know that you're happy with the placement you can mist it a little bit like after you put it down you can put some down after you've wet the base layers if you want just know that once it touches that wet surface it's going to stick you won't really be able to adjust it so it is an option to wet your base layers first and then apply that but you know, it's going to stick immediately <laughs> if you do that. So moisture is going to be your friend on days like that. Mm -hmm. If the air, you, and you might have to deal with having the air conditioning off if the air is blowing it around sometimes. You have to turn the air off. <laughs> yeah. DB asks, would a silk hanky stretched across the fabric work or would you have issues when you're going to cut the petals? Uh, no, a silk, a silk hanky would work. Um, we're cutting this fiber too and I've cut plenty of silk hankies but it does depend on how clumpy it is and you might like it on the petals. So I would again just make a small sample piece, make it as clumpy as you want it to be because you can stretch a hanky not just as big as this we had um, Kate Kaprowski was here years back and we were making hats together and I'd never seen anyone stretch a hanky so far but we <laughs> Jordan or were you yeah, there because the Jordan was there this is years ago and two people stretched a hanky like 10 feet or some ridiculous <laughs> like it, it was ridiculous how far they were able to stretch this hanky so that is to say hankies can be really thin or really clumpy make a small tiny piece see how you like it cut see how you like it in the petals cut you are going to see if it's clumpy you are going to see that chopped line you know you are going to see it then you're felting the, the, the petals a little bit after but I'm, it's hard to say how much of that fiber is going to be up to feed up and grab those cut ends so check it out what else? As far as Angelina, would you lay it in between merino or just layer it on top? Yeah, Angelina is a non-felting fiber. So I did bring some a couple of little samples in from days of old. Um, this is our artful felt fabric. It was one of the first times we just played with y'all and said, hey, let's just make something weird. And we threw down some pre-felts. It didn't matter. Our PFM and PFL, I made a great big one or a couple of great big ones. And then we cut them all out into a whole bunch of things over time. So this was our artful felt fabric. And you have a bunch of stuff on here. I have Angelina here and here. So let's come in a little bit close. I want to show you some of these things. Um, I'm going to get a little close in here too. Okay. So here's some Angelina uh, right here. And here's some Angelina right here, and here's some Angelina in this piece right here. If you don't hand blend fiber, and I think we made these, we did some mini samples together, probably we did some lives where we did some mini, mini samples together. And this one is a blue with a very prominent fiber placed over top to kind of staple it down. But what you see is Angelina, if just chunked on top, doesn't want to integrate. Um, with the fiber it doesn't really want to go anywhere it's much I think the diameter you know is thicker than the fibers we're working with um, it's very straight it's a polyester um, so it really does require fiber to help it integrate and this patch right here is probably the best example because it's very little compared to amount of the fiber so the ratio I would say with the Angelina a little goes a long way in from being like fun a little bit of bling, a little bit of sheen to being kind of like, hmm, that just looks like something stuck on top. So it does just kind of look like something stuck on top because it doesn't want, it doesn't want to migrate. So you can consider carding it in with your fiber um, so that you get a little more integration, but Angelina will require a fiber application, uh, particularly benefit from a longer fiber, like longer than let's say, um, a pre-felt, you know, blend it with your merino top so it has a better chance to integrate. What else? If you are not putting any bling fibers, should you do a third layer or just leave it at two? 
There's no reason to, to do a third layer if you don't want to put any bling fibers. There's no reason to. The, the design layer or the sheen layer doesn't add any weight or any real body um, to the material. Now, that's not true because it adds it adds a different texture, you know, and it, it does have a different level of integrity than the fiber, but you don't have to add a third layer. And I always encourage that um, you have of your merino an equal number of layers not just the merino but just think of the foundation of your fabric if you have a third layer that's one more layer of things being pulled in one of the directions if you do a standard crisscross so if you go left to right north to south left to right you can you can expect more shrinkage in one direction so consider having an equal number of layers that's my suggestion Awesome. Unless if you use batting. If you use like a batting, the directions are already mixed up. Um, so you don't have to worry about it as much. It's going to have less of an influence on the shrinkage of your fabric. Sure. Um, as far as cutting the pet petals, we have a couple people asking, sure. um, when you cut them, uh, how do you stop the edges from fraying? And if they are fraying, does that mean you haven't felted it enough? Oh, that's a really great question. So um, for those of you who missed um, last week, I brought in my petals uh, felted and curled. So what we did is we cut out every individual petal and my preference is to either use a pencil or Taylor's chalk and I drew on these um, with a iron off or not a iron transfer pen, uh, just a marker or something so you could see them. We cut out each individual petal and then we hand felted them, either rubbing them between your hands or rubbing them on the bubble wrap. So what I did is I felted the fabric to that 25-30% shrinkage. I rinsed all of the soap out and did my vinegar soap and soak and cleaned up everything. Then um, once the fabric was dry, we cut out all of our petals and then we hand felted to them and twisted them uh, and set them to dry overnight. So we basically felted them a little bit more or healed the edges a little bit more by hand and with bubble wrap without any soap in it. And then I twisted them to these interesting shapes and then set them to dry overnight. So now the edges are not fraying and you know this isn't going to become a bottle brush <laughs> it's going to sit you know it's going to sit I mean decoration um but the edges are not they're not going to fray if you look at them up close you'd feel like it's done especially for a decorative item yeah and how much would you wet felt if you wanted to needle felt something on top or cut this up and needle felt it into something else would anything change Okay, so that's two different applications, but if you're going to needle felt a design into this, um, I would felt it as much as possible if you're not going to wet felt it anymore. You know, so if you just need a basic start of a background, you're going to needle felt into it, and then you want to wet felt it again, then you can stop right here at the 30%. If you need something that has a little more density or a little bit more integrity, then shrink it more. You might even decide to make it thicker. It's really up to you and you're going to want to test your own application. So if we're needle felting into a fabric, you want it sort of as ready to receive as much of that material as possible. And I would say you have to go at least this far, the 25, 30%, at least that far on if you're doing something like the fine merino top, but you might consider taking it further. Now, if you wanna cut it up and use it in other things, that's kind of the same. Take it at least to that 30% mark because you want it to have integrity and you don't wanna wet felt it anymore. But if you want to felt it, cut it, and then needle felt it, into something else, you want it to be integrated into something else, you might stop a little shy of here and go around 20% because maybe what you want is a pre-felt. And if you want it to really bind with the other stuff um, and you want to be able to needle felt it in, it's it. you probably don't want to take it too much past where this is. In order to get these petals to bind, I did have to trap it down with other fiber on top because they're pretty felted and they don't really want to stick all on their own. So you're going to need some binding, whether you're going to sew it in, fine, but if you want to needle felt it in, um, yeah, I'm going to say make a test piece. Depends on what you're, what you're making, what it's going into, but you're going to need something to bind those edges into the background. Otherwise, it needs to be less felted. Mm -hmm. Susan's yeah. interested in making a fabric for clothing. Would this work for that? And is two layers strong enough? Are you going to be wearing the clothing yourself? 
That's my question. Usually with clothing, or it really depends, are you making a coat, are you making a tunic, are you making a vest? Um, you want it to be really well felted and minimum 30%. In some cases, you might shrink it a little bit more because you want it to be a really strong fabric. Are you going to be sewing it into the final piece? Um, you really want to felt it pretty well. Very often when we're making clothing, if you're talking about for yourself as opposed to a doll and you want it to be wearable, very often we are going to use um, silk fabric as a base layer, especially like a gauze or a chiffon, so that that doesn't get too heavy. But you want to felt it really well so that it holds up to wearing and doesn't stretch out too easily. You want it to stretch just enough to fit you right. So um, we do have some wet felt wearables tutorials in our school if you're looking to felt things for yourself. There's a wonderful sunset dress by Charity Vandermeer. She has a very simple process where she basically teaches you how to control your shrinkage by your fiber layout. And she makes the template process really easy. Um, and creates amazing wearables that will fit your body. So you might check that one out. And then Diana Nagorna has a coat uh, that you can cut and sew. So you felt cut and sew the pieces together. That's really interesting. And she also has a really fitted dress. And she, her uh, pattern making is a little more complex, um, but felting something to fit, you are gonna wanna felt it very well so that it really holds up but you might check out a couple of those tutorials. That'd be helpful for you. Susan says she has a hard time getting it to reduce as much as you do. Most of the time she has to throw it in the washer and dryer. Do you have any tips? Yes, okay, Susan. So um, I would be very interested to know if you have time to answer this. How many times have you rolled? Because I think what you're saying is, yeah, I basically have my felt started, but I'm not getting the fulling or the shrinkage. When we full a fabric, we shrink it. And what we're doing is we're taking it, honestly, from this size, and, and I do have pictures of these, I wish I had uploaded it, but we're taking it from this whole big piece and even a little bit bigger, because once you wet it, you know, things mush out a little bit, so it goes slightly over, down to this size. So once I have, I've taken my piece, I rolled it a hundred times from this side, I spun it a hundred times, a hundred, a hundred. I flipped it over, same thing, a hundred, a hundred, a hundred, a hundred. It didn't shrink very much. It didn't shrink very much, but what I had was the start of a felt, a soft felt, a pre-felt, and then I had to keep felting it or fulling. It feels like the same thing, but what I do is then I'll just roll it on itself without the, um, without the pool noodle or the pole in the middle, roll it on itself, roll it on itself, constantly turning it, rolling it. You can heat it up at that point. So once you feel like you have a basic fabric, you can handle it, you can flip it over, you can now heat it up. I didn't heat any of these up ever. I never even used hot water, but I just rolled them on themselves, rolled them in my hands. I wadded them. That's one of my favorite ways. Uh, once I had rolled from all each direction, so wadding and throwing, which is the washing machine is like, can be like throwing and uncontrolled shrinkage. You don't really want to do any of that until you have a pretty good fabric going and you're starting to see shrinkage. So my recommendation to you is one, tell us how many times did you actually roll both sides? Did she tell us? Mm -hmm. how she much? says 100 minimum each direction and then flip. That's not enough. That is stage one, you're starting to get the felt. So then get rid of your center roll, whatever you're using, closet pole or pool noodle, and instead roll your piece like this Roll it on itself, uh, Jordan. Give us a overhead. Uh, roll it on itself so that it's much smaller, um, if you will. And uh, yes, it's going to be much smaller. You're going to roll it on your bubble wrap or your super bubble or your bamboo mat, whatever. Roll it like this, all directions the same. And if you're still not getting the shrinkage or if one corner is coming out, roll that corner in and rub it hard. You're going to increase your pressure. And I would do all four sides again. You, again, you can heat it up with the hot water and then you could consider wadding and throwing. But uh, go another hundred and do it without a center roll. And now 
you know, you're really going to start to see it shrink. Now, the other thing I really like to do, um, you can palm, and we have a free video series in the school. It's called The Fundamentals of Wet Felting where I kind of encourage you to make samples, but I take you through the basic processes, and I think I also cover the some basic fulling, but you can palm things, especially if it's thicker. If you palm, you're going to be with your hands wet and soapy, and again, this is in the fulling stage, so after you've you know really got a base fabric going, you can pinch it and lift it and pick it up. You can rub it between your hands like this, so your hands are wet and soapy. Um, Jordan. Your hands are wet and soapy and you're really going to get it and smash it between your two hands and rub them like this. This is called palming. So you can do that doing circles like once you have a good fabric going and you can put your hands back on that bare fabric without messing it up. Soap and water soap so your hands are soapy and really give yourself tight hard rubbed circles so that you're getting things going in this direction as well. You're going to find that your fabric really starts to come together. If it's bigger, fold it in half so that you can get more of it in your hands and squeeze it, roll it, squeeze it, roll it, squeeze it. Like I'm squeezing every time. But this is all controlled. Like when you're doing, you know, any rolling or rubbing, you're controlled. And then once you're going to feel it start to get more dense. The other thing might be is to check that it doesn't have too much water in it when you get into the folding stage. So once you have that basic fabric coming together, you don't want to be able to pick it up and have water dripping out. So you can give it a gentle squeeze as long as you have a good fabric coming together. And you'll find sometimes that removing water or you can blot it down dry with a little bit of a towel. Sometimes just removing water can be your friend. So I would just, you know, keep making samples and good for you for noticing that it hasn't really gone as far as you think it can. I, my challenge to you is to pick it up now, go back to it, re-wet it, reheat it, and just full it or watch that free video on the fundamentals of wet felting. You can jump straight to the fulling part and um, just tackle it because I bet you'll see it shrink up for you. I think our final question is how do you attach them to, you know, a pin back or a magnet? Oh yes, and I did I did grab a couple of magnets. So I know we turned something into a magnet. Um, and I do you remember the what mushrooms, one? right? The mushrooms. Okay, so on the mushrooms, here's a here's a pin a magnet back and we have these in the shop. I'll show you a couple things. So this is just a little bar magnet. I really like it cuz it's really gentle on your clothes and it's a very strong magnet. So you can um, glue that right to that. You could just glue that right to that if you want. You can also glue that to that and then put a piece of felt over the top, whether you sew it or glue it, and then maybe cut little holes so this is sticking out. Or in most cases, it'll be strong through that. See how strong these are, it just wants to pick it up. So if you're just doing something like that, you can glue it to the back or sew it under a piece of felt. I think we also did that last year. And then we have these pin backs, let me grab one. Um, my friend Dawn turned me on to these a couple of years ago and we have them in the shop. It's a little pin back and it also has a little necklace bail on it. So you can wear this as a necklace or dangle it from something and a pin back like this you would hand sew right on. Just run a couple of stitches right through there. So I would either put a magnet right on the back or bury that under felt or you can sew a pin back on just like that. Or you could use a different magnet and put it under there, but yeah, any of those will work. Cool. Y'all, well, thank you so much uh, for playing with us and for your questions. They're so helpful. They're helpful for everybody. And mostly, we just want to help you learn how to felt, have fun with the process, um, and enjoy yourself, and then make some cool stuff as well. And we're here to help. So now listen, I have a special announcement of who my guest is going to be next week. And then stay tuned for just a few more minutes because we're going to grab some names out of the hat and see who's won some prizes. But my very special guest next week is coming. Um, many of you, if you're in our group, Living Felt Friends on Facebook, you've seen her work. We've all admired her work. And we have been planning this for a long, long time. Coming all the way from Budapest, Hungary is Esther. 
Esther Zrubka on Facebook. You might know her as Esther Baba, and she is coming to teach some fantastic classes. Here's a little pop-up of her being featured in an article. She is gonna be on a plane very soon. She's gonna arrive, and we're gonna start filming. And if you wanna know what she's gonna teach, you're gonna have to come back next week and meet her. We're gonna be filming um, classes for our online school, Felting Tutorials. Dot com. It's free to join. Check it out. We have wet felting and needle felting classes. Lots of really fun things you can learn. And Esther's going to be filming a class for that. So we're very, very excited and hope that you'll come back and meet her and just get to see some of her wonderful creations. Um, and that's it for today. So we're going to draw some names. Do we have a hat? Oh, you Jordan sure has some names. Very good. <laughs> so this is Jordan who's been behind Jordan. the camera. <laughs> and why don't you draw a name, Jordan? Aww. Thank First you step. for helping us. And thanks for being here, everybody. We really appreciate you. Oh, boy, this hat is full. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> a lot you of been, questions You've been busy over there. <laughs> okay. So you are going to win one of our wet felting of flower kits. And if you don't like that, well, then we'll give you the needle felting of mushroom kit this time. Cool. How's that? Okay. So who do you Got. I have Debbie Norling and I have Colleen Bud or Booty Ooh. I don't know how to say <laughs> it but congratulations y'all thank you so much for being here today look make yourself something fun take some time just for yourself and mostly just treat yourself well and maybe give yourself some reason to smile today you really <laughs> deserve it thank y'all thank Bye. you